Chapter 4, Alfred Adler. In many ways, Adler's theory of personality is the opposite of Freud's. Freud viewed individuals as constantly in conflict with one another and with society, whereas Adler viewed them as seeking companionship and harmony. Freud ignored questions concerning life's meaning and the effects of future aspirations on one's life, whereas Adler made these questions a central part of his theory. Freud saw the mind as consisting of different components, often in conflict with one another, whereas Adler viewed the mind as an integrated whole working to help attain the future goals of the person. So by choosing the term individual psychology for his theory, Adler by no means intended to imply that people are selfishly motivated to satisfy their own biological drives. Rather, he meant that although individuals are unique, they are characterized by inner harmony and a drive to cooperate with fellow humans. Adler's theory is related to humanism because of its concern for the positive relationships among humans. His theory is related to existentialism because of its concern with questions regarding the meaning of human existence. Adler shared with the ex existentialists the belief that humans are future-oriented, a belief shared by Jung, free to determine their own fate and concerned with the meaning of life. Clearly, little similarity exists between Adler's individual psychology and Freud's psychoanalysis. Biographical sketch. Alfred Adler was born in the suburb of Vienna, Austria on February 7, 1870. His father, Leopold, was a moderately successful grain merchant. Adler grew up, in, up under comfortable physical circumstances and was able to enjoy the open spaces, relative freedom, from want and a city, Vienna, that was one of the great cultural centers of Europe. In addition, he was able to share his love of music with his entire family. Despite apparent physical comfort, however, Adler looked on his childhood as miserable. He thought of himself as undersized and ugly. He was a third of seven children and had a major rivalry with his older brother, who was very athletic and a model child. Adler's mother seemed to prefer his older brother to him, but Adler got along very well with his father. Adler's views of himself were not without foundation. He was a sickly child who was unable to walk until he was four years old. He suffered from rickets that prevented him from engaging in any strenuous physical activity. One of my earliest recollections is of sitting on a bench bandaged up on account of rickets with my healthy elder brother sitting opposite me. He could run, jump, and move about quite effortlessly. While for me, movement of any sort was a strain and an effort. Everyone went to greet great pains to help me, and my mother and my father did all that was in their power to do. When Adler was five, he caught pneumonia and almost died. In fact, he heard the doctor say to his parents, your boy is lost. The illness, the death of a younger brother in a bed next to his when he, Adler, was three, and being hit twice by cars caused him an awareness and a fear of death. He decided to become a physician when he grew up, believing that such a profession would provide a means of conquering death. Contrary to what one may think, Adler remained a friendly, sociable child with a genuine love for people, traits he retained all his life. His unhappiness continued in school where he began as a poor student, especially in mathematics. One of his teachers counseled his parents to train him as a shoemaker because he apparently was not qualified for anything else. Eventually, however, Adler became one of the best students in his class. Adler's childhood ambition was realized when he obtained his medical degree from the University of Vienna, Freud's alma mater, in 1895. He first specialized in ophthalmology, diseases of the eye, and later changed into general practice, and finally to psychiatry. Two years after his graduation from medical school, he married Raisa Epstein, a rich Russian girl who came to Vienna to study. Raisa was a particularly liberated, domineering woman who was a militant socialist. It is interesting to note that perhaps under his wife's influence, Adler's first publication came the year after he married Raisa, and it concerned the terrible working conditions of independent tailors and the need for socialized medicine for the poor. Marxism remained an influence in Adler's life, and it influenced his theory of personality. From Marx, Adler learned that, he, that the social context within which one lives can significantly influence one's personality. Marx's philosophy was also supported Adler's deep concern for common people. The Adlers had four children, one daughter, daughter Alexandra, and the only son, Kurt, became a psychiatrist 
and continued his father's work in individual psychology. Adler's wife died on April 21, 1962, at the age of 89 in New York City. Adler read Freud's book, The Interpretation of Dreams, and wrote an article defending Freud's theoretical position. On the basis of this defense, Adler was invited by Freud to join the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society in 1902. Adler accepted Freud's invitation, thereby becoming one of Freud's earliest colleagues. Adler became president of the society in 1910, just a year before his official break from the Freudian group. It appears now that joining the group may have been a mistake from the beginning because Adler had little in common with Freud. His incompatibility became increasingly obvious in 1911, while he was still president of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society, and after a nine-year association with Freud, he resigned from the society. The two men never met again. The differences between Adler and Freud that caused the separation were numerous, and are reviewed at the end of this chapter. But the following quotation from Freud's biographer, Ernest Jones, lists a few of Adler's beliefs that were contrary to Freud's. Sexual factors, particularly those of childhood, were reduced to a minimum. A boy's incestuous desire for intimacy with his mother was interpreted as the male wish to conquer a female, masquerading as sexual desire. The concepts of repression, infantile sexuality, and even that of the unconscious itself were discarded so little was left of psychoanalysis. Freud characteristically had a low tolerance for defectors, and remained hostile to Adler all his life. Adler was the pygmy in Freud's statement, I made a pygmy great. Adler said of Freud's theory that it was founded on the mythology of sex and that psychoanalysis was stimulated by the selfishness of a pampered child. Freud, who couldn't understand the grief a friend was suffering over the death of Adler, said, I don't understand your sympathy for Adler. For a Jewish boy out of Vienna, suburb, a death in Aberdeen is an unheard of career in itself and a proof of how far he had got on. The world really rewarded him richly for his service in having contradicted psychoanalysis. For more, more information on Freud and Adler, Fiber provides interesting details concerning Adler's initial professional involvement with Freud and the sources of dissension between Adler and Freud, and the nature of the relationship between the two following Adler's excommunication. After breaking the, the, the Freudians, Adler and his followers formed a group first called the Society of Free Psychoanalytic Research to express their contempt for the restrictive nature of the Freudian organization. However, they soon changed their name to Society for Individual Psychology because they did not want to be perceived as simply rebels against psychoanalysis. Because the term individual psychology can be easily misunderstood, the next section of this chapter clarifies its meaning. Adler served as a physician in the Austrian army during World War I, and following his release, he was asked by the government to open several child guidance clinics in Vienna. This is one of Adler's early effects to apply his theory to the problems of child rearing, education, and other everyday problems. Many of his books, articles, and lectures, of which there were hundreds, were directed, under, were directed either toward teachers or toward the general public. Adler's fame quickly spread, and in Vienna, he was surrounded by many students, friends, and admirers. Freud, disturbed by all this, proclaimed incorrectly that Adler's theory was actually nothing but psychoanalytic knowledge that Adler had labeled his own by changing his terminology. In 1926, Adler first visited the United States and was warmly received by educators. In 1927, he was appointed lecturer at Columbia University, and in 1932, he became professor of medical psychology at the Long Island College of Medicine in New York. In 1935, partially because of the Nazi takeover in Europe, Adler made the United States his permanent home. He died of a heart attack on May 28, 1937, in Aberdeen, Scotland, while on a lecture tour there. One peak in the popularity of Adler Adlerian psychology was in 1930, when 2,000 people attended the Fifth International Congress of Individual Psychology in Berlin. Another peak is more recent, according to Ansbacher. The Adl Adlerian movement today numbers several thousand members in the United States, Canada, and European countries, especially Germany. It is composed of psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, counselors, and educators, as well as lay people who accept the theory and apply the method of Adlerian psychology to family life and personal development. Adler's theory continues to be promoted today by the American Journal of Individual Psychology, 
and by the American Society of Individual Psychology. Heinz and Rowena Ansbacher summarized many of Adler's ideas in two volumes. Adler was a strong believer in bringing his ideas to non-professionals, a task perpetuated by Rudolf Dreikers. Organ Inferiority and Compensation in 1907, Adler published his now famous essay titled Study of Organ Inferiority and Its Physical Compensation. In this essay, Adler put forth the idea that people are especially vulnerable to disease in organs that are less developed or inferior to other organs. For example, some persons are born with weak eyes, others with weak stomachs, others with weak hearts, and so others with damaged limbs. These biological deficiencies cause problems in the person's life because of the stresses put on them by the environment. These organic weaknesses inhibit the person from functioning normally and therefore must be dealt with in some way. Because the body acts as an integrated unit, a person can compensate for a weakness either by concentrating on its development or by emphasizing other functions that make up for the weakness. For example, someone with a frail body may work hard to overcome this frailty. Likewise, a blind person may concentrate on developing auditory skills. In both cases, a biological weakness is compensated. In some cases, a person may overcompensate by converting a biological weakness into a strength. Two examples are Jim Abbott, who was born with one on hand, but became an Olympian and Major League Baseball pitcher, and Winston Churchill, Churchill who overcame a speech impediment to become a great orator. At this early stage in the development of his theory, Adler emphasized biological inferiority, compensation, and overcompensation. Feelings of inferiority. In 1910, Adler shifted his emphasis from the actual organ inferiority to subjective inferiority, also called feelings of inferiority. By co now, compensation or overcompensation was directed toward either real or imagined inferiorities. At this point in his theorizing, Adler left the biological sciences and entered psychology. Anything that caused inferiority feelings was worthy of study. Adler pointed out that all humans start life with feelings of inferiority because we are completely dependent on adults for survival. Children feel completely helpless compared to the powerful adults on whom they depend. This feeling of being weak, impotent, and inferior stimulates a child an intense desire to seek power, thereby overcoming feelings of inferiority. Early in the evolution of Adler's theory, he stressed aggression and the power as means of overcoming feelings of inferiority. Unfortunately, but mainly because of cultural conditions at the time that Adler was writing, he equated power and strength with masculinity and inferiority with femininity. For Adler, this included considering traits such as aggression, wealth, freedom, and bravery as being masculine, while, uh, while obedience, poverty, and any weakness was associated with being feminine. According to Adler, Every person has feelings of weakness, femininity, and an impulse to become strong, masculinity. And in that sense, all humans are bisexual. For Adler, however, bisexuality was primarily psychological, whereas for Freud, it was primarily biological. And that is, Adler did not believe that anatomy is destiny, or that he believed that attitudes toward oneself and towards others are destiny. In any case, at this stage, Adler's theorizing to become more powerful meant to become more masculine, and consequently less feminine. He referred to this striving to become more masculine as the masculine protest, because both men and women seek to become powerful enough to overcome inferiority feelings, both attempt to approximate the cultural ideal of masculinity. In other words, both men and women engage in the masculine protest. Adler believed, however, that the cultural over-evaluation of masculinity or femininity was not positive for either men or women. In his writings, Adler mentioned that rigid gender expectations and roles can cause conflict between the sexes, even damaging marriages. The masculine protest occurs in any culture where power is associated with males and weakness of females. In any culture where females are perceived as powerful, the situation is reversed and there is a feminine protest. For Adler, then, sexuality was important because of what it symbolized within a culture, rather than because of biological gender differences. Feelings of inferiority as motivational. Are feelings of inferiority bad? No, said Adler. In fact, being human means feeling inferior. It is a condition common to all humans and therefore is not a sign of weakness or abnormality. 
In fact, such feelings are the primary motivating force behind all personal accomplishments. One feels infer inferior and is therefore driven to accomplish something. A short-lived feeling of success exists after such an accomplishment. But in light of the accomplishments of others, one again feels inferior and again is motivated to accomplish more, and on it goes without end. However, even though feelings of inferiority act as a stimulus for all positive growth, they also create neurosis. A person can become overwhelmed by feelings of inferiority, at which point he or she is prevented from accomplishing anything. Under these circumstances, feelings of inferiority act as a barrier rather than as a stimulus for positive accomplishment. Such a person is said to have an inferiority complex. According to Adler, all humans experience the feeling of being inferior, but in some it stimulates neurosis and in others it creates a need to succeed. We have something to say about what makes a difference later in this chapter. Striving for Superiority Adler modified his theoretical position to state that it is not more aggression, power, or masculinity that we seek, but superiority or perfection. Adler now referred to striving for superiority as the fundamental fact of life. Adler's theory had evolved from the point at which it emphasized compensation for organ inferiority to that at which subjective inferiority was compensated through aggression and power, to that at which the fundamental fact of life is that all humans strive for superiority perfection. What is the origin of the striving for perfection? According to Adler, it is innate, it is innate to all humans. It runs parallel to physical growth. It is an intrinsic necessity of life itself. All our functions follow its direction. Rightly or wrongly, they strive for conquest, surety, increase. This impetus from minus to plus is never ending. The urge from below to above never ceases. Whatever premises all our philosophers and psychologists dream of, self-preservation, pleasure principle, equalization, all these are but vague representations attempts to express the great upward drive, a fundamental category of thought, the structure of our reason, the fundamental fact of our life. In his final theoretical position, Adler retains striving for superiority as the master motive, but he changed from striving for individual superiority to striving for a superior or perfect society. As we have seen, Adler believed that feelings of inferiority could result in positive growth or in an inferiority complex. Adler also believed that striving for superior, superiority could be beneficial or harmful. If a person concentrates exclusively on his or her own superiority while ignoring the needs of others and a society, he or she may develop a superiority complex. A person with a superiority complex tends to be domineering, vain, boastful, arrogant, and depreciative of others. This description may bring to mind some historical leaders. According to Adler, such a person lacks social interests, discussed in the latter section, and is indeed undesirable. Weihinger and Fictional Goals and Lifestyles In 1911, Hans Weihinger published The Philosophy of As If, a system of the theoretical, practical, and religious fictions of mankind. Weihinger's major premises were, one, we can only be certain of sensations, that is, the subjective conscious elements provided by sensory stimulation and the relationships among them because we experience the physical world only indirectly through sensations. And two, in order to make sense of our sensations, we invent terms, concepts, and theories that give them meaning. According to Val Hinger, such inventions of, or fictions make all of civilized life possible. Thus, although the fictions by which humans live are figments of the imagination, they have a great practical value. The principle of fictionalism is as follows. An idea whose theoretical untruth or incorrectness, and therefore its uh, falsity, is admitted, is not for that reason practically valueless and useless. For such an idea, in spite of its theoretical nullity, may have great practical importance. Adler embraced Valhinger's philosophy enthusiastically, and made it an important part of his theory. However, whereas Valhinger was primarily interested in demonstrating how the use of fiction in science, mathematics, religion, philosophy, and jurisprudence made complex societal life possible, Adler applied the idea of fiction to the lives of individuals. 
From the interpretation of early experience, various worldviews can result. For example, the world can be perceived as an evil or dangerous place to be avoided, or as a pleasant or loving place to be embraced. It is important to emphasize that for Adler, subjective reality was more important than physical reality, that it is, that it is the child's perception of the major events in his or her life that determines his or her worldview, not actual reality. If the child perceives the world to be a harsh, unpredictable place, he or she will adjust by creating life goals that incorporate those facts. If the child perceives the world as a warm, loving, predictable place, then those perceptions will be important in his or her adjustments to life. Because the important early experiences that mold a child's personality are those most vividly remembered through the years, they are the ones most likely to be reported as a person's earliest recollections. It was for this reason that Adler believed that one's earliest memories provide important information about one's life goals and one's lifestyle. We have more to say about the importance of first memories later in this chapter. Coupled with feelings of inferiority, a child's worldview will determine his or her final goal, or fictional finalism, and his or her lifestyle. If a negative worldview develops, the child will believe that he or she must do battle with the world or escape from it in order to gain superiority. Here the goal will be to dominate, to defeat, to destroy, or to withdraw. If a positive worldview develops, the child will believe that he or she must participate in the world in order to gain superiority. Here the goal will be to join in, to create, to love, or to cooperate. Either type of worldview can manifest itself in a number of lifestyles. In turn, these lifestyles can manifest themselves in a number of professions. For example, a person with a negative worldview may become a ruthless business person or politician, a criminal, a hermit, or a domineering parent, teacher, or spouse. A person with a positive worldview may become a loving parent, spouse, teacher, physician, social worker, artist, writer, philosopher, theologian, or a politician whose goal is to improve the human condition. The concept of fictional finalism, which Adler later called a guiding self-ideal, or simply a guiding fiction, gave Adler's theory a strong teleological, future-oriented component, but it did not ignore the past altogether. Now we can view the person as pushed by feelings of inferiority or imperfection toward perfection, using his or her unique lifestyle as a means of attaining some future goal. Adler emphasized that these future goals or ideals are convenient fictions invented to make life more significant than it otherwise would be. Healthy people, according to Adler, change fictions when circumstances warrant it. Neurotic persons, conversely, cling to their fictions at all costs. In other words, according to Adler, healthy individuals use fictional goals or ideals as tools in dealing with life. Life is unbearable without meaning, so they invent meaning. Life is chaotic without a plan for living, so healthy persons invent such a plan. For healthy persons, such goals, ideals, or plans are means of living a more effective, constructive life. For the neurotic, the idea that these are only tools is lost. The goals, ideals, or plans become the ends in themselves, rather than means to an end. As such, they are retained even when they have become ineffective in dealing with reality. Thus, for Adler, an important difference between the healthy person and the neurotic is the ease of which fictional tools can be dispensed if circumstances warrant it. The healthy, or normal person, seldom loses sight of reality, whereas the neurotic person, the fictional life plan becomes reality. Adler explained, this neurotic, explained that neurotic individuals can only adhere to this unrealistic plan, while those who are not neurotic are able to change and adapt as the reality of their environment demands. We are reminded once again why Adler's theory is called individual psychology. The individual invents a worldview and derives a final goal or guiding self-ideal from that worldview. The individual then invents a lifestyle as a means of achieving that goal. All of this invention implies a great deal of personal freedom, an implication we explore further when we discuss the creative self later in this chapter. Social interests. Adler's early theory had been criticized because it portrayed humans as selfishly motivated to strive for personal superiority. With this concept of social interest, Adler put such criticism to rest. Social interest was, according to Adler, 
and innate need of all humans to live in harmony and friendship with others and to aspire toward the development of a perfect society. As we have seen, the attainments of the perfect society replace perfection of the individual as a primary motivation in Adler's theory. A well-developed social interest relates to almost all aspects of one's life. However, according to Adler, a person on a person on inherits the potential for social interests. If that potential is not realized, the person will live a most unfortunate life. Simply put, those without a well-developed social interest are neurotic or worse than neurotic. In all human failure, in the waywardness of children, in neurosis and neuropsychosis, in crime, suicide, alcoholism, morphinism, cocainism, in sexual perversion, in fact, in all nervous symptoms, we may, need, may read lack of proper degree of social feeling. According to Adler, each individual must solve three major problems in life, all of which require a well-developed social interest. One, occupational task through constructive work the person helps to advance society. Two, societal task. This requires cooperation with fellow humans. Adler said it was only because man learned to cooperate that the great discovery of the division of labor was made, a discovery which is the chief security for the welfare of mankind. And three, love and marriage tasks. The relationship between this task and the continuing society is clear. Without reproduction, society will fail. What determines whether a person will have a well-developed social interest or not? Primarily, the mother. According to Adler, the first major social situation the child encounters is in relation to the mother. The mother-child relationship acts as a model for subsequent social relationships. If the mother maintains a positive cooperative atmosphere, the child will tend to develop a social interest. If, however, the mother binds the child exclusively to herself, the child will learn to exclude other people from his or her life and will develop low social interests. For Adler, it is the nature of the mother's early interactions with the child that primarily determines whether or not the child will have a healthy, open attitude toward other people. In the final version of Adler's theory, a person's fictional goal and lifestyle must take the improvement of society into consideration. If they do not, the person will be neurotic. For Adler, then, social interest was the index of normality. Mistaken lifestyles. Any lifestyle that is not aimed at socially useful goals is a mistaken lifestyle. We already have encountered two examples, the person who seeks personal superiority, the superiority complex, and the person who is so overwhelmed by feelings of inferiority so as to accomplish nothing, inferiority complex. Both individuals lack social interests, and therefore their lifestyles are mistaken or incorrect. Adler delineated four types of people who are labeled according to their degree of social interest. The four types of people are, one, the ruling dominant type, who attempts to dominate or rule people. Two, the getting leaning type, who expects everything from others and gets everything he or she can from them. Three, the avoiding type, who succeeds in life by avoiding problems. Such a person avoids failure by never attempting anything. And four, the socially useful type, who confronts problems and attempts to solve them in a socially useful way. The first three types have faulty or mistaken lifestyles because they lack proper social interests. Only the socially useful type can hope to live a rich, purposeful life. Where do faulty lifestyles originate? Adler said they begin in childhood at the same time that a healthy lifestyle order originates. Adler described three childhood conditions that tend to create a faulty lifestyle. The first is physical inferiority. That can stimulate compensation or overcompensation, which is healthy, or can result in an inferiority complex, which is unhealthy. The second is spoiling or pampering. That makes a child believe it is up to others to satisfy his or her every need. Such a child is the center of attention and grows up to be selfish with little, if any, social interests. Neglecting. The third condition causes the child to feel worthless and angry, and to... Look on everyone with distrust. Adler considered pampering as the most serious of parental errors. The most frequent difficulty is that the mother excuses the child from giving her any help or cooperation, keeps caresses and affection on him, 
and constantly acts, thinks, and speaks for him, curtailing every possibility of development. Thus she pampers the child and accustoms him to an imaginary world which is not ours and in which everything is done for the child by others. Adler elaborated on how pampered children and adults view the world by saying that these individuals expect that their needs will be immediately attended to by others. When this does not happen, and when the individual is not the center of everyone else's attention, they become confused. They have been raised to be entitled to expect to receive and never give. Adler considered these individuals to be the most dangerous. Adler would likely be very dismayed over the current parenting culture and the prevalence of a permissive style of parenting. According to Adler, pampering creates the Oedipus complex. We could probably induce an Oedipus complex in any child. All we would need is for its mother to spoil it and refuse to spread its interest to other people and for its father to be comparatively indifferent or cold. Adler evidently viewed Freud's theory of personality as the creation of a pampered child. He said that if children are allowed to de never deny their instincts and disregard the welfare of others, they become the pampered child. The opposite of pampering is neglect, and it too gives the child an erroneous worldview. In the case of neglect, the child develops the impression that the world is a cold and unsympathetic place. And it is on this worldview that the child formulates his or her life's goals and lifestyle. According to Adler, the neglected child begins the view to view the world as an unfriendly place due to the lack of love he received as a child. He will also underestimate his ability to cope with such a world and will feel that he is unlikely to ever receive either companionship or respect from others. Family experiences other than pampering and neglect can lead children to have distorted worldviews and therefore faulty lifestyles. According to Adler, other negative family experiences include failure to express a normal amount of tenderness or to consider sentimentality as ridiculous, excessive use of punishment, especially corporal punishment, establishment of standards of goals that are unattainable, excessive criticism of the people, and considering one parent superior to the other. It's important to remember that when considering the factors that may lead to a mistaken lifestyle, that is the child's perception that determine his or her personality, not reality. A pampered child who feels neglected will develop the worldview of a neglected child and vice versa. Adler said it is not the child's experiences which dictate his actions, it is the conclusions which he draws from his experiences. Creative Self Hall and Lin Lindsay called Adler's concept of the creative self his crowning achievement as a personality theorist. They went on to say, here at last was the prime mover, the philosopher's stone, the elixir of life, the first cause of everything human for which Adler had been searching. With his concept of the creative self, Adler stated that humans are not simply passive recipients of environmental or genetic influences. Rather, each person is free to act on those influences and combine them as he or she wishes. Thus, no two people are ever the same, even if the ingredients of their personalities are similar. We saw earlier that some persons with physical inferiorities compensate and become socially useful. Others develop an inferiority complex and accomplish nothing. To Adler, the difference is largely a matter of choice. According to Adler, heredity and environment provide the basis for their lifestyle, not a definite path. He said that it's up to the individual how they use what they have been given that determines their lifestyle and path. Elsewhere, Adler said, we can see that every child is born with potentia potentialities different from those of any other child. Our objection to the teachings of the hereditarians and every other tendency to overstress the significance of constitutional disposition is that the important thing is not what one is born with, but what one, but what use one makes of that equipment. As to the influence of the environment, who can say that the same environmental influences are apprehended, worked over, digested, and responded to by any two individuals in the same way? To understand this fact, we find it necessary to assume that existence is still another force, the creative force of the individual. But other then, personality is essentially self-created. People assign meaning to their lives according to their perceptions of the world, themselves, and others. This is essentially an existentialist viewpoint. Safeguarding Strategies All neurotics have in common a self-centeredness, 
a concern with their own sense of security and superiority. That is, they lack social interests. According to Adler, neurotics know or feel that their goal of personal perfection is a mistaken one and may be exposed. Such people, ex such public exposure would heighten the neurotics' already intense feelings of inferiority. Adler believed that neurotics use safeguarding strategies to protect what little self-esteem and illusions of superiority a mistaken lifestyle can generate. The feelings of self-esteem and superiority experienced by healthy persons are real because they are based on social interests and, therefore, they do not need to be supported by deceptive strategies. Other safeguarding strategies are similar to Freud's ego defense mechanisms, except, unlike ego defense mechanisms, safeguarding strategies are used only by neurotics, can operate either on the conscious or unconscious levels, and protect persons from outside threats and the problems of life. Adler discussed three categories of safeguarding strategies, excuses, aggression, and distancing. Excuses. The neurotic develops symptoms and uses them as excuses for his or her shortcomings. For example, they may develop incapacitating headaches and then be unable to work because of them. This safeguarding strategy consists of the yes, but, and if only excuses that protect a weak sense of worth and deceive neurotics and those around them into believing they are more worthy than they really are. Freud, too, was well aware that patients often use their symptoms to gain attention and to rationalize ineffective behavior. Freud refers to these benefits of illness as pleasurable secondary gains. Aggression. According to Adler, neurotics may also use aggression to protect their exaggerated sense of superiority and self-esteem. Neurotic aggression can take three forms, depreci depreciation, accusation, and self-accusation. Depreciation is a tendency to overvalue one's own accomplishments and to undervalue the accomplishments of others. There are two common types of depreciation. The first is idealization, or the use of standards so high in judging people that no real person could possibly live up to those standards. Thus, real people will be depreciated. Adler gives the example of idealization of a young woman who sets ridiculously high standards or expectations for a potential partner. As a result, there are few men who will actually meet the criteria that they have set. A second type of depreciation is solicitude. This, that is, exemplify when neurotics act as if other people are incapable of caring for themselves. Using this strategy, neurotics constantly offer advice, demonstrate concern, and generally treat other people as children. Neurotics thereby safeguard their value, vulnerable feelings of self-esteem by convincing themselves that other people could not get along without them. The second type of neurotic aggression discussed by Adler was accusation, or the neurotic's tendency to blame others for his or her shortcomings and to seek revenge against them. Adler believed that the element of revenge exists in all neurosis and that neurotic symptoms are often designed to make others suffer. Adler said, In the investigation of a neurotic style of life, we must always suspect an opponent and note who suffers most because of the patient's condition. Usually, this is a member of the family. There is always this element of concealed accusation in neurosis, the patient feeling as though he were deprived of his right, that is, of the center of attention, and wanting to fix the responsibility and blame upon someone. Thus, according to Adler, a major goal of neurotics is to make those thought to be responsible for the misfortunes suffer more than they do. The third type of neurotic aggression discussed by Adler is self-accusation, which involves blaming oneself. This can even result in self-mutilation and suicide. Adler said that this form of self-harm usually stems from the child's desire to hurt the parents or get some attention from them. Adler thought that in injuring themselves, neurotics really attempt to hurt or at least get the attention of other people. Also, guilt-inspired confessions are often used to inflict misery on other people. Adler gives the example of a domineering woman who confessed to her husband that she had deceived him with another man 25 years before. She accused herself of being unworthy and attributed the confession to guilt. Adler wondered why the woman would want absolution after all those years. He reasoned that the facts of the case show that the woman was attempting to hurt her husband by her confession and self-accusation because he no longer obeyed her.
distancing. According to Adler, neurotics often escape from life's problems by distancing themselves from them. Adler discussed several ways in which neurotics do this, moving backward, standing still, hesitating, constructing obstacles, experiencing anxiety, and using the exclusion tendencies. Moving backwards involves safeguarding a faulty lifestyle by reverting to a more secure, less complicated time of life. This form of distancing often involves the use of disorders such as attempted suicide, fainting, migraines, refusal to take food, alcoholism, and crime to obtain the attention of others, to gain some control over them, and to avoid social responsibility. About standing still, Adler said that these individuals are almost frozen. They cannot begin to accept reality or make definitive decisions. The disorders that Adler thought facilitate standing still include insomnia, with subsequent incapacity for work, a weak memory, masturbation, and important impotence. Hesitating involves vacillating when faced with difficult problems. Adler believed most compulsions serve the purpose of occupying a neurotic long enough so that he or she is finally able to say, it's too late now. Adler gave the example of someone with OCD becoming so occupied by their compulsions that they do not make a decision until it's too late. Constructing obstacles creates distances distance that might be successfully overcome, whereas other forms of distancing remove the neurotic from the problems of life. According to Adler, neurotics can create relatively minor obstacles in their lives through such things as mild anxiety, certain compulsions, fatigue, sleeplessness, constipation, stomach and intestinal disorders, and headaches. These and other types of obstacles create, an, create a no-lose solution for the neurotic. The individuals can then say they would have done something different except their anxiety or lack of sleep. It allows them to avoid responsibility and action. Experiencing anxiety amplifies all the distancing strategies. Neurotics are often fearful of undertaking such as leaving an undertaking such as leaving home, separating from a friend, applying for a job, or developing opportunities for relationships with members of the opposite sex. Insofar as these and other experiences cause anxiety, neurotics will attempt to distance themselves from them. The greater the amount of anxiety, the greater the distance sought. Using the exclusion tendencies to avoid life's problems, the neurotic lives within narrow limits. He may minimize interaction in an attempt to maintain control. This would include be being habitually unemployed as an adult, postponing marriage indefinitely, doing poorly in school, and maintaining close social ties only with one's family members. The various types of safeguarding strategies are summarized in Figure 4 too. Goal of psychotherapy. Healthy persons have a well-developed social interest. Unhealthy persons do not. Those with faulty lifestyles, however, are likely to continue having them because lifestyles tend to be self-perpetuating. As we saw earlier, a lifestyle focuses a person on one way of looking at things, and this mode of perception persists unless the person runs into major problems or is made to understand his or her lifestyle through education or psychotherapy. Individual psychology considers the essence of therapy to lie in making the patient aware of his lack of cooperative power and to convince him of the origin of this lack of early childhood maladjustments. What passes during this process is no small matter. His power of cooperation is enhanced by collaboration with a doctor. His inferiority complex is revealed as erroneous. Courage and optimism are awakened and the meaning of life dawns upon him as the fact that proper meaning must be given to life. By using analysis of birth order, first memories, dreams, and mannerisms, all discussed shortly, Aldarians trace the development and manifestation of a mistaken lifestyle, one that necessitates therapy because it is ineffective in dealing with life's problems. The patient, with the therapist's help, seeks a new lifestyle that contains social interests and therefore will be more functional. The Ad Adlerian approach to therapy avoided criticism, blame, punishment, and an authoritarian atmosphere because these things typically amplify the patient's already strong feelings of inferiority. The therapist sits face to face with the patient and is informal and good humored. Patients are not allowed to use their neurosis, however, to gain the sympathy of the therapist, as they once may have done with, other, with their parents or other persons. 
Although the therapist avoids pampering, he or she also avoids the opposite error of neglect. The Adlerian therapist believes that any insights gained should be explained with such clarity that they will be understood and accepted by the patient both intellectually and emotionally. The Adlerian therapist expects to see some improvement in the patient in about three months, with sessions once or twice a week, and considers it rare if the entire therapeutic process takes more than a year. Adler was always interested in common people, and a high percentage of his clientele was from the lower middle classes, a rarity among psychiatrists of his time. Also extremely unusual was the fact that Adler worked directly with children. Adler typically treated children in the natural setting of their homes and insisted that the parents participate in the therapeutic process. As a result of his approach to treating children, Adler is considered one of the founders of group and family psychotherapy. Also, Adler insisted on treating problem children in front of public of a public audience in mental health clinics to help the children realize that his or her difficulty is a community problem. As innovative and effective as Adlerian psychotherapy is Adler is, Adler always insisted that the prevention of disorders through proper child rearing and education was far easier and less costly than treating disorders later with psychotherapy. Adler's view of the unconscious. With his concept of the creative self, Adler denied the very foundation of Freudian psychoanalysis, that is, the importance of repressed traumatic experiences. Instead, he said that we interpret them according to our worldview. Once a worldview, a guiding, once a worldview, a guiding fiction, and a lifestyle formulated by an individual, all experiences are interpreted relative to them. Experiences compatible with a person's personality can be consciously pondered. Those experiences incompatible are simply not understood. Thus, for Adler, compatibility with one's personality determine the difference between conscious and unconscious experience. If a person's personality changes, as it hoped will happen in therapy, many experiences previously not understood become un understandable. We can only be aware of those experiences that make sense to us. All others are simply incomprehensible. We see in chapter 13 that George Kelly explained the unconscious in essentially the same way as Adler did. Methods of Research Adler referred to birth order, first memories, and dreams as the three entrance gates to mental life, and he studied them extensively to discover the origins of a person's worldview, life goal, and lifestyles. Birth Order Adler contended that each child is treated differently within a family depending on the child's birth order, and this differential treatment influences a child's worldview and thus his or her choice of a life's goal and lifestyle. Above all, said Adler, we must rid ourselves of the superstition that the situation in the family is the same for each individual child. Adler concentrated his research on the firstborn, secondborn, youngest, and the only child. The firstborn is a focus of attention until the next child is born, at which time he or she is dethroned. According to Adler, the loss caused by the birth of a sibling is felt deeply by the firstborn, because now the attention of the mother and father must be shared with a rival. Adler wrote that children who have lost the power they held as a firstborn are better able to understand how valuable authority can be. The age of the firstborn when the secondborn can make a substantial difference, however, if the firstborn is old enough to have already developed a lifestyle, and if that lifestyle is a cooperative one, and the firstborn may develop a cooperative attitude toward the new sibling. If not, the resentment toward the new sibling may last a lifetime. The secondborn has to be extremely ambitious because he or she is constantly attempting to catch up and surpass the older sibling. Of all the birth orders, Adler thought the secondborn was the most fortunate. According to Adler, the secondborn behaves as if in a race, as if someone were a step or two in front and he or she must rush to get ahead. Adler believed that these children may have difficulty accepting others who attempt to have power over them. The youngest child is, according to Adler, in the second worst position after the firstborn. Adler stated that the reason for this is that this child is often spoiled, which prevents him from becoming independent. Even if the child is ambitious initially, his success is undermined by the pampering from his family 
and is likely to become lazy. Adler believed the laziness in this child develops from the realization that he will never be able to achieve his ambition. The youngest child, according to Adler, is the one most likely to seek a unique identity within a family, which is becoming a musician in a family, a scientist, or vice versa. The only, the only child is like a firstborn who is never dethroned, at least by siblings. The shock for the only child usually comes later, like in school, on learning that he or she cannot remain the center of attention. The only child often develops an exaggerated sense of superiority and a sense that the world is a dangerous place. The latter results that the parents are overly concerned with the child's health. The only child is likely to lack a well-developed social interest and display a parasitic attitude, expecting others to offer pampering and protection. Only children are often very sweet and affectionate, and later in life they may develop charming manners in order to appeal to others as they train themselves in this way, both in early life and later. We do not regard the only child situation as dangerous, but we find that, in the absence of the best educational methods, very bad results um, which would have been avoided if there had been brothers and sisters. Many factors can interact with effects of birth order, bringing about results contrary to those generally expected. Such factors include the sex of the older or younger siblings, the number of years separating them, and most important, the way the child views his or her relations with other members of the family. For many reasons, then, all of Adler's remarks concerning the effects of birth order must be interpreted as describing only general tendencies. Adler intended them to be viewed in this way. We reviewed the outcome of various attempts to empirically validate Adler's predictions concerning the effects of birth order on personality when we evaluate Adler's theory shortly. First memories. For Adler, the best way to identify a person's lifestyle is to obtain the person's earliest recollections of infancy or early childhood. These memories represent one subjective starting point in life. It is irrelevant whether these memories are accurate. In either case, they reflect the person's interpretations of early experiences, and it is interpretation of experience that shapes the child's worldview, life goal, and lifestyle. It is these interpretations of experience that are recalled as first memories. It follows that a close relationship among one's first memories, life goal, and lifestyle must exist. Adler explained that this first memory would guide the view of the rest of the individual's life or show the way it was developed. Adler believed that a person's lifestyle changes, so will their early memories. For example, if a person becomes a very anxious adult, their first memory would be likely to be a fearful one, while if they have more of a depressed personality, their first memory would likely be sad. As we have seen, Adler's own first memories were of illness and death, and it was his concern about these, mother, these matters that steered him in the direction of medical careers. Herther Ogler, Adler's friend and biographer, reported that Adler gave up his general medical practice after the death of several of his diabetic patients before the discovery of insulin. Apparently, his first memories of helplessness in the face of death were rekindled. Adler then turned to psychiatry, in which psych psychological death of a mistaken lifestyle and rebirth, the attaining of a new lifestyle with a healthy amount of social interest, were possible. Adler asked more than 100 medical physicians for their earliest memories, and most of them were of either serious illness or a death in the family. Dream Analysis Adler agreed with Freud on the importance of dreams, but disagreed with Freud's interpretation of them. According to Freud, dreams allowed partial satisfaction of a wish that would be impossible to satisfy directly in a waking state. For Adler, dreams were always an expression of one's lifestyle, and must be consistent with it. To Adler, however, the occurrence of dreams almost always suggests the dreamer has a mistaken lifestyle. Dreams, according to Adler, offer emotional support for mistaken lifestyles. He asserted that dreams are more likely to occur in individuals who choose to live in an irrational or illogical way, and less likely to occur than those who have a very meth methodical and evidence-based approach to life. Typically, dreams support a faulty lifestyle by creating an emotional state that will carry over into waking life and will justify actions compatible with a dreamer's faulty lifestyle. For example, if a student unconsciously wants to create a distance between himself or herself and an important examination, 
he or she may dream of being chased by criminals, fighting a losing war, or being forced to attempt to solve unsolvable problems. The student awakens from the dream experiencing such emotions as fear, discouragement, or helplessness, the very emotions that will support a decision to delay or avoid the forthcoming examination. Adler believed that dreams are only important for the emotions that arises from them. Thus, in the case above, the anxiety about performance is the main theme. Adler further said that if the individual has a healthy style of life, the dreams will create feelings that also occur in other aspects of the individual's personality, such as symptoms or traits. Adler emphasized the self-deceptive and therefore unhealthy nature of dreams. In dreams, we are fooling ourselves. Every dream is an auto-intoxication, a self-hypnosis. Its whole purpose is to excite the mood in which we are prepared to meet the situation. In summary, Adler believed that most dreams provide the self-deception necessary to maintain a mistaken lifestyle, and therefore people with healthy personalities dream little or not at all. That is, healthy persons require no self-deception, and therefore do not require the irrational emotional support provided by dreams. Behavioral Mannerisms In addition to analyzing birth order, first memories, and dreams, Adler also observed a client's characteristic ways of behaving in order to gain an understanding of his or her lifestyle. He observed such things as how a client walked, spoke, dressed, and where and how he or she sat. He also observed if a client was constantly leaving on some, leaning on something, the distance maintained between the client and the people, and eye contact or lack of it. The goal was always to understand how the client viewed the world or and him, himself or herself. Summary of the differences between Adler and Freud. The major differences between Adler and Freud are summarized on Table 4-1. As demonstrated below, although Adler began as Freudian in his theory, eventually differed in many ways. 4-1, differences there between Adler and Freud. Evaluation. Empirical research. Although Adler's theory had been extremely influential in the field of psychotherapy, most of the research generated has explored the relationship between birth order and various personality characteristics. Although considerable research has been conducted in this field, the recent research has found little evidence of significant differences among siblings. Rohr, Eglod, and Schmuckel set out to address the question of birth order's effect on personality by examining three large samples in the United States, United Kingdom, United States, and Germany. This study was an attempt to update previous research and was conducted in a highly controlled manner. To address previous methodological concerns, Rohr, Egloff, and Schmuckel examined personality characteristics using both between and within family designs. Additionally, they addressed concerns about sibling spacing by looking at siblings with only 1.5 to 5 years between them and tried to correct for previous research by using specific controlled measures, such as using the Big Five approach to explore at personality traits. When this control method was applied, the researchers found very little evidence to support that there are consistent differences among individuals based on birth order. Specifically, when they assessed the Big Five characteristics, they did not find any significant variation in these traits among siblings. The research also looked at masculine-sibling relationships to determine whether the, hip the hypothesized feminism of later born sons was based in science. Their research also did not reveal any significant difference in feminine traits in male siblings by birth order. As to the previous hypothesis that birth order affects intelligence, Wagner and Schubert uh, or et al. did find a small relationship with birth order, birth order and intelligence, consistent with previous research. In this study, they found that intelligence declined slightly, 1.5 IQ points, but significantly with each position in the sibling order. If authors contend that there may be may still be consistent personality differences in siblings in regard to other traits, but this study concluded that based on this research and previous large-scale studies, there are no significant differences in the Big Five personality traits based on birth order. Studies continue to be conducted on this topic, however, and some have provided additional evidence for Adler's theory. For example, one recent study examined the differences between the only child or children and not only children. Yang et al. looked for neurological evidence of differences in only and not only children and found them in the areas of creativity and flexibility. 
The study found that only children are higher in creativity and lower in flexibility than non-only children. Other researchers attempted to replicate the Sulawesi research from 1996, stating that latter-born children are more likely to accept innovation. In this small Italian sample, researchers did find that first-born children were more likely to be conservative than second-born children. Finally, other areas of interest and differences related to birth order could be based on social interaction rather than personality. Salmon, Cuthbertson, and Figueroa found some differences in pro-social behavior between first-born and more subsequent-born children, especially between first- and second-borns. It may be that Adler's theory does not apply to the Big Five personality traits, only to other more subtle personality characteristics. Criticisms Difficult to falsify Like the theories of Freud and Jung, many of the terms in, def in Adler's theory are not defined precisely enough to validate. Because they lack clear definition, it is difficult, if not impossible, to determine the impact of such concepts as inferiority, superiority, social interest, and creative power on a person's personality. Adler's contention that everything can also be different makes it practically impossible to make a falsifiable prediction using his theory. As we have seen, Adler believed it was subjective reality that determines behavior, not an objective reality. Therefore, if a person develops a personality, unlike the one that is supposed to, supposed to characterize, for example, his or her birth order, it can always be attributed to the person's unique perceptions of the situation. Also, Adler claimed that heredity and experience provided only the raw materials of personality, and the creative self acts on those materials to, hold a unique to mold a unique personality. The concept of creative self, then, makes it impossible to predict adult personality characteristics on the basis of either heredity or environmental experience. Overly simplistic. All good. Adler claimed that it is often very few early experiences that determine adult personality, and if a person's interpretations of the world based on those experiences could be changed, an unhealthy lifestyle could be changed into a healthy one. Also, Adler relied almost exclusively on social factors in explaining personality minimizing biological hereditary factors. Finally, Adler contends that in the final analysis, personality is or could be freely chosen by each person. Many modern personality theorists consider all these Adlerian consumptions to be overly optimistic. Also, it is believed that all humans are born with innate potential for social interests. Adler had trouble explaining the widespread occurrence of war, murder, rape, crime, and other human acts of violence. Many believe that the theories of Freud and Jung are far better able to explain the more unseemly aspects of human behavior. Contributions The importance of social variables Although some consider Adler's emphasis on social variables a negative aspect of his theory, others consider the emphasis as Adler's most significant contribution. Adler vividly pointed out that the world each person lives in is a world of his or her own creation. Furthermore, the most important factor in formulating that worldview is a person's relationship with other people. For example, a person's family constellation is one variable that can influence his or her worldview. The importance of social variables for personality development was minimized by Freud and Jung. Widely influential. Adler's terms lifestyle and inferiority complex have become part of everyday language. In the realms of personality theory and psychotherapy, we see Adler's influence in the contemporary emphasis on self-selected goals as determinants of behavior, social determinants of personality, family therapy, group therapy, and community psychi psychiatry, the importance of subjective reality as opposed to objective reality, and personal freedom and responsibility in living one's life. Several influential persons regard Adler's contribution to psychology as greater than Freud's. For example, Albert Ellis says, Alfred Adler, more ever than Freud, is probably the true father of modern psychotherapy. Some of the reasons are, he founded eco-psychology, which Freudians only recently rediscovered. He was one of the first humanistic psychologists. He stressed holism, goal-seeking, and the enormous importance of values in human thinking, emoting, and acting. He correctly saw that sexual drives and behaviors, while be having great importance in human affairs, are largely the result rather than the cause a man's non-sexual philosophies. It is difficult to find any leading therapist today who in some respect does not owe a great debt 
to the individual psychology of Alfred Adler. Viktor Frankl stated that Adler's opposition to Freud was no less than a Copernican switch. No longer could man be considered as the product, pawn, and victim of drives and instincts. On the contrary, drives and instincts form the material that serves man in expression and action. Beyond this, Alfred Adler may well be regarded as an existential thinker and as a forerunner of the existential psychiatric movement.